standard X still have to talk English? Yes. Okay. So, good morning. <laughs> the, we are just after a series of lectures on electromagnetism and electrodynamics. So you are all extremely well groomed in the understanding the basic principles of electrodynamics. And we also have learned a lot about a relatively modern mathematical tool called differential forms and to describe, among other things, uh, properties of electromagnetic fields. But electromagnetic fields are also uh, something wrong with this. Uh, the electromagnetic fields are also uh, being used in everyday life, and uh, it just so happened that uh, in everyday use we use slightly differently uh, theory of electromagnetism than proposed, described uh, in the lectures of Professor Virula. Therefore, my <coughs> lecture today will be a kind of an introductory lecture on electrodynamics, but electrodynamics in an applicable way. How, what, how you use electromagnetic equations to solve certain problems. Actually, I'm a bit confused with this lecture today, for I was asked to give a series of lectures, and this is supposed to be the, the kind of a trailer or a primer of those lectures. Nevertheless, we are going to talk about the electromagnetism in action, in the sense which will allow us to solve the problems which are more or less shown on this view graph. Namely, we, how do you calculate the properties of the wires, antennas, and all sorts of the equipment which you use in everyday life? And I was actually prompt to deliver this series of lectures. Uh, 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 when uh, our washer, which we had at home after 20 years, collapsed and we purchased a new washer and that new washer had uh, the following uh, 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 information in it and that is unfortunately in Polish Tradycyjne silni konwencjonalne wytwarza energię za pomocą specjalnych szczot. So that is uh, basically, uh, I, uh, I use this to show you what is basically the understanding of the fact that we are all depending on the electromagnetism in our <coughs> daily life. Actually, uh, as you know, the there is this, this new coin which is supposed to take over uh, the financial system, well, which will not happen anyway, which is called the Bitcoin. And I think it's wrong because if everybody, if, if someone will eventually introduce the world coin, so to say, it should on it have a, a sign which is the electric charge for we are paying most of our taxes and all of our economy depends now on actually on two physical constants, the electric charge of an electron and the Planck constants. If the Planck constants, I mean, if we, Professor Zorzewski had a series of lectures of quantum mechanics and uh, the, as you know, the quantum mechanics is essentially the science about the Planck constants and one of the chapters in every book on text quantum mechanics is the semi-classical limit. This is what happens if your age goes to zero. So if we will apply the quasi-classical limit to the world economy and took the age going to zero, something like the 80% of the uh, world economy will evaporate. Uh, uh, all, the, the, all four biggest companies on the stock market will be gone. This is Apple, Amazon, Alibaba, and Microsoft will be gone for they base of the trade on the transistor, and transistor is the 
device which will disappear if the plant constant was equal to zero. Therefore, the world economy is based on the E and H, and that, of course, can be combined with the velocity of light, and we will have a Sommerfeld constant, and so maybe the Sommerfeld constant should be on the thing. So that is the understanding of electromagnetism today, and how it was some years ago. This, uh, uh, I found the cartoon from 92 years ago, and that was the understanding of a science of electromagnetism 92 years ago. This is a, this is a cartoon from, uh, you can see it already, it's a Carl Arnold who was a drawing from the journal Simplicius. It was a kind of a, a satiric journal appearing in Berlin in the 20s. It, of course, it was shut down in 33 immediately. And as you see, this is the Berlin, and everybody is talking on a cell phone. Uh, already at that time, Arnold had invented the cell phone. It's slightly different, as you see, in shape, because the transistor was unknown at that time. Therefore, all this uh, drag loads with wireless telephones had to be built with the, with the lamps. But nevertheless, it's very modern. Because if you remember the movie uh, with the Clint Eastwood uh, from the Second World War, called for the Braves, then he uses a cell phone at this, in this movie, which is a huge one, and he barely is able to move with it. So, <laughs> the, uh, so in the 26th, they understood. Okay, this is a, now something more serious. This is a syllabus of our, of this series of lectures. So we will be having a chapter zero today uh, about this introduction. And then I will go on with several uh, seemingly pretty trivial uh, applications. But the kind of um, uh, direction which we will be following in this lecture is how to derive everything from the Maxwell equations. Uh, actually, I have the uh, one of the things which is sort of haunting me is that we are teaching children in the school electricity and we are not telling them about the Maxwell equations. For there is a story that the Maxwell equation is, is uh, are these strange nebulas or differential forms or whatever and how we can tell it in a, in, a, in a high school. But I think it's a 21st century, and any program in physics in a high school which does not have anything on the Maxwell equation is basically wrong. We are not teaching the fundamental part of the physics, right? <coughs> and therefore, uh, I'm trying desperately to figure out how to introduce the Maxwell equations without uh, real mathematics. Okay. So that is the sign of us, and this is our thing, and I will start from statics, static science of electricity, and there's something which is called electrostatics, and uh, this, this is the ancient history, there were people like Coulomb and like, uh, like um, uh, uh, others who had uh, analyzes what are the, uh, and of course, Benjamin Franklin, who invented this notion of a negative and positive charge. Actually, there is a charge. There's this joke in Poland about our former president who used to say about the plus, that there are positive and negative pluses. So this is like with these charges. There is a charge that are positive and negative charges. The, the name was invented by Benjamin Franklin. And uh, we know that the force between two charges is given by the Coulomb law. The Q is the, the charge, R is the distance between them, and if we want the, to measure the force in Newtons and the charge in Coulombs, which is the, uh, the legal uh, uh, unit system uh, in this country, uh, uh, then uh, the, this constant epsilon zero 
has the following value and it is it, it, its unit, proper units are far less divided per meter. So that's the that's the the Coulomb force, and uh, it allows us to define the electric field. The electric field acting on the charge Q is given by the very simple expression, and we measure it in the volts per meter. And that is the formula which tells us that the, this electric field is a real physical field which exerts the force of the charge. It is a, we, this is important because we, we know from the previous lectures that in the Maxwell equations there is also the D field and we will be discussing in a moment the difference between these two fields. Okay, so let's continue. Because of the electric <coughs> field is a vector field, and if, uh, 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 if, if there is no magnetic field present, then we <coughs> can introduce a concept which is called electrostatic potential, and then the electric field is a gradient of a potential, and this potential is measured in volts, and uh, this is an expression for the potential created by a charge Q, and we can easily calculate potential. Having the notion of a potential, we can define a potential difference, that is, between two points in the electromagnet in the field, electric field, and that potential difference between two points is then given by the line integral of the of the electric of the electric field. Um, well, and now of course things become a little bit more complex. If the electric field is not in the vacuum but in the medium. And of course, most of the electromagnetic fields we use in the practice are not really the electromagnetic fields in the vacuum, except of electromagnetic waves which you are sending, but there are electromagnetic phenomena happening in the medium, and the mediums are divided into the contacting media and the non-contacting media, which are called dielectric media, and they have the, the difference you learn all these differences in the, in the course of the solid state physics, but the, roughly the difference between the dielectrics and the, for example, piece of metal is that in metal there are free electrons, the charges can move. I mean, they, in the metals they move, but in, the, in, the, in some materials these are the ions, positive ions which moves such a such a system, such a physical compound in which these are positive ions which moves and the motion of electrons is rather irrelevant, is something which is called IoT. Uh, and, uh, the, the, and there are substances called superconductors which are basically the open I'm taking it back. Uh, let's not discuss superconductors for a while. So, uh, uh, in, but in dielectrics, the charges do not move a considerable distance. They can be a little bit displaced, and when there is no electric field present, then they come back to the, so to say, equilibrium positions. And this this property results in the fact that the electric field in the dielectric media is slightly different than the electric field in uh, vacuum and uh, also in the metal. In the metals, the properties of the electric field that the metals will be discussed in a moment, but if we are having a dielectric medium, then the electric field can, is, can be, is weakened. And uh, is, uh, there is a uh, simple way of describing is by introducing a physical 
characteristic of epsilon, which is called the dialectic constant. Oops, I'm sorry. Charge and plus charge. 
Yes, that's, is, the, that's, uh, that is of course the same, the, because the definition what is a plus charge and minus charge is completely arbitrary. Absolutely, but E so, is... So, so that, would, that can be, but not since, since I have introduced a plus and minus charges before, I, I cannot do it because I will run it, but I absolutely, that in a, in a, in a strict formal way, that is of course the definition what is plus and minus charge. But which one sits on the beginning of the arrow and That's which right. sits on the end of the arrow. But once I have this, uh, the, but in any case, it is very important to realize that it points that way because the solution of the sum problems depends on it. And this is a picture I have is a, is a how, and of course, because E is a vector field, then there is something which actually the Faraday formulates his, his Electromagnet is using the concept of the line of forces, and these are the lines to which the electric field is constant at each point, and that is how those line of forces look like when we have what? How many? Four charges here. You can see how they they look, and as you see, this this is a pretty complicated pattern, which can develop. In the, all right. Then you have three positive and one negative as far as I can see it. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't even know what that, they, they, they were positive and negative. Okay. Uh, the other concept which is uh, of some importance is called polarization. And if you have a medium into which we apply the electric field, and if electric field is homogeneous, then basically nothing interesting is happening. But imagine what happens when this electric field is inhomogeneous, which I shown here by making these arrows slightly thicker. So the electric field is non-homogeneous. And then there are these charges in the medium which are loosely bound to some point, so they can move a little bit when the field to it is applied. They cannot wander long distance. This is obviously a hand-waving argument because in a metal, <coughs> they, we are talking, I, I just said actually that in the metal electrons move freely and in the dielectric medium they, they conduct apart by the short distance. But electrons in the metals do not move <laughs> freely. Not and, uh, for example, it's not true that the power plant on the Shikerki is sending electric current via all those wires which are underground because the standard question is then where are those trucks delivering electrons to the, to the factory if it sends it through, the, through those wires. The electrons in the metal move on is also very fine in fine distance and th this is what we call current going over the the wire that is an electron electromagnetic wave which is propagating and we will come to this in a while. But let me let me continue and if I apply this this field that what happens to the to the uh, electrons you cannot see unfortunately because for some reason <coughs> ah, you see this little the the charges have displaced right if the field well, then the positive charge move, move in one direction and negative charge move in the one direction and they move farther and farther but they cannot move very far away and therefore if I apply this in homogeneous field then I can introduce uh, actually a charges and these two charges are induced in the medium so they are called induced charges and therefore the, the charge in the medium consists of two parts, a free charge, the, I mean external charges if I have it, which generate the electric field and those charges which have been induced because the electric field had, has done something to that medium. And, uh, uh,
and uh, okay, they will disappear. For some reason, that is does not show on my screen. This is funny. Retardation. <laughs> okay. And that means uh, it is it is convenient to relate those uh, uh, induced charges to a vector, which is called the polarization vector, and in which is defined such that the density of those free of those uh, induced charges is equal to the divergence of the polarization vector taken with the sine minus for some reason. And therefore, if you do this, then uh, you uh, can re rewrite our Gauss equation, Gauss equation in the medium in the following way. And uh, then the vector d, which is called the displacement field, is given by the equation, the divergence of it is equal to the free charges and the relation between epsilon and uh, between d and p is written here. If the medium is such that the polarization vector and electric field are related by linear law, that is if the polarization is tiny little bit is zero when there is no electric field and is proportional to the applied electric field, then I can uh, write that <coughs> expression in that way, which brings me the definition to the definition of the dialectic constants and in the relation to the polarization vector. All right. So that is how we how it looks like. And now, of course, I would like to use a few minutes to discuss the Poisson equation. Since the electric field is given as a potential, is given as a gradient of a scalar potential, then the scalar potential obey an equation which is called the Poisson equation and which has a beautiful solution given in this form here. And this denominator xn minus x prime is a green function of the of Laplacian epsilon. So this is a, a, a very interesting equation, and I will show you a solution for it. I, mean, we, I would like to show occasionally some applications. So consider I have a uniformly charged sphere where the charge density inside of the sphere is rho, and the radius of the sphere is capital R. Then how do I solve it? I mean, the system, the, the, this problem has a spherical symmetry. So the only difficult part is to write the Laplacian in the spherical coordinates. And that is an expression of Laplacian coordinates. And of course, it splits into the radial part and the coordinate, uh, angle dependent part. And since everything has a spherical symmetry, what remains from our equation is on the, the radial part. And we have to solve it outside and inside of the sphere separately, and then match the solutions on the surface. So outside of the sphere, this is an equation, and the solution of it is pretty difficult because the potential has to go to zero at infinity. So that is the form of it. And I can also look up at the, uh, I, and these coefficients are the total charge in a sphere, and uh, the total charge is the density of the charges in sphere times its volume. Okay, how, the sec how do I solve it outside? No, inside of the sphere, the inside of the sphere, the solution of the radial part of the Laplace equation is that, and therefore I have uh, after I substitute that into the Poisson equation, I get the relation for those coefficients. And because a potential has to be continuous on the surface, I got the relation between those coefficients. And that is finally the solution outside and inside. So we solve the potential, and then we can calculate the gradient of it. And that the gradient of it can, can, will give us an electric field. And, but that was
was a trivial solution, and if I have a more complicated situation, I have to solve the Poisson equation in its beauty. It turns out that the Poisson equation is probably the most versatile equation in applications. And in many, many other branches of science, which are far, far, far from the electromagnetism, we encounter uh, Poisson equations. For example, what is not so obvious at the, very, at the beginning, yeah, people who are calculating a shape of the car, I mean, the, 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 the engineer gets a problem to, project, to build up a new car, which will have a certain global properties, a volume, and they will have to get as low as possible this cabalistic number, which is called the wind resistant coefficient, denoted by C with index W. And quite miraculously, when he turns out these hydrodynamic equations and everything, he ends up with the Poisson equation for the shape of the car. So he had to solve it. So those who, and that is why all, essentially all the cars nowadays are identical. Because in the, I mean, what, what remains to this artist is to make the mirrors slightly different and, and maybe the color strips on them, but the, the shape of the, of the car becomes pretty much one because the solution of a Poisson equation is unique. So once we get the solution, that is this solution. And, I, and how to solve the, the, Poisson, the Poisson equation in application, that is a very long course in the mathematics. And but I but just what wanted... What about the boundary conditions? I mean, solutions depend on the boundary conditions. Yeah, so once... And sure, for this car, there are boundary conditions, which comes out... But they are different for different shapes. Uh, That's why it the, turns the out that the shape is determined by the, the boundary conditions <coughs> are essentially this wind resistant coefficient. The, the wind resistant coefficient basically because there are also hydrodynamic equations. Ah. Because you solve the car, okay. you know, I, I, what I said, after you reduce everything, you are finally solving this Poisson equation. And, I just wanted to mention four methods of solving the Poisson equations. Each of them is a subject for a semester course by itself. One is the something pretty trivial. It's a second order the partial differential equation. So it is easy to build up a, a kind of a grid uh, of the points and to, and to convert it into the matrix equation. And this is called the grid method. And that grid method is pretty inefficient if the shapes and boundary conditions are pretty complicated. The other method is a method which is called the Galerkin method. And that is a method which has been invented to solve the Poisson equations when there were no computers. If there were no computers, people would still had to build things, and quite remarkably. For example, they were building plates before the computers were invented, and quite miraculously those planes fly. Uh, so they had to solve this method, and uh, there is a method of Galerkin, which originally was the intent converting the Poisson equation in solution into this integral equation by this solution with the Green function, and having a Green function for a complicated object is not that easy thing to find. So there were approximated ways of finding the Green function. Nowadays, the Galerkin method is a variation method which is applied, which is used, for example, very often by people in engineering of the building houses. The, the, these mathematical architects are using the Galerkin methods very often. The very modern method is called the finite element method in which uh, the, the, which is extremely powerful method of calculating, solving the Poisson equation. And there is a, something pretty interesting, which is the last one, which is called the phase field method. And the phase field method is very new, and it has actually come out from physics. 
and uh, was essentially born in the in the 70s, and it's a product of uh, metallurgists, who, who, because in the metallurgy, in application problems, also you basically solve the Poisson equations, and at the certain at the certain one of the problems in the in the metallurgy is if you have a, a something which you have made, and for simplicity, let's think about making a cannonballs, which is a spherical object, and uh, it, when, when, you, when you make it in, a, in, a, in a metallurgy, it's usually hot. So you have a question, what happens when this giant object cools itself down? And it turns out that the problem of cooling down or heating up the spherical object reduces, of course, to the Poisson equation. And uh, 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 at the, in, in, in early 70s, uh, yeah, in early 70s, two metallurgists, uh, Bob Mullins and Bob Sekerka, uh, uh, in fact Robert Sekerka from uh, Poprad, uh, had uh, found out that if you cool up, that if you have this spherical object which is cooling. Uh, <coughs> Uh, then it, is, it becomes unstable. And they discover a phenomenon which is called the Mullins and Sekerka instability. And uh, people have been very keen to understand how the Mullins and Sekerka instability model applies uh, to objects which are not spherical symmetric. And they, they, there was very little progress in it. And then, uh, for example, one thing which was very exciting for people is how the, how the dendrites, how snowflakes, how they are formed, right? They, they have these dendrites pointing out. So how that happens that if something is cooling down, it develops a complicated shape. And, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, well, the Mullins was an interesting person. You might know that there was a president of the United States which got, was got rich Nixon, and so far it's the only president who resigned. And uh, before he resigned, there was a political confusion in the United States, and there was a famous list of enemies of the White House published by, by Richard Nixon, and on that list was, was Bob Burns. And Bob Burns was a professor of metallurgy at Carnegie Mellon University. I was at the time at Carnegie Mellon in the 70s, and I remember that he, he finally, the, on, the, on his, uh, in the corridor leading to his office, there was a sign, visitors who want to see Bob Morris are currently directed to go to the Carnegie Zoo, and I will be presenting myself, because everybody was coming to see Bob Morris. <coughs> so these are mathematical methods which are solved the Poisson equation, that's a, that's a giant piece of the con contemporary numerical mathematics. Okay. So let's keep going. We also have a Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force is a, a, because in the nature, in addition to the electric fields, we also have a magnetic field. And the magnetic field uh, is, uh, uh, there's an, again a confusion names, uh, but if I have a charge, and when the charge moves in the physical object, which is called magnetic field, then there's a force acting on it. The force is called the Lorentz force, and the field which exists there is called the magnetic flux field, and is denoted by letter B. And remember that in the electrostatics, the electric field was a real physical field force acting on the charges. And D, the displacement field, was an effective field resulting from the charges, which you calculate from the charges. And this is the difference which is fundamental and, uh, as you know, a subject of the discussion. But nevertheless, this is basically what is convenient to remember. While in a, when there is a magnetic field, it, there will be a slightly, again, we have to define a physical field by a force. So the Lorentz force is a force. 
So the f real physical field which appears in the, in the Lorentz force is called the magnetic uh, flux B. Uh, if I have an electric current, which I will forever denote by the capital letter J, then if I have a wire where, uh, through which the electromagnetic uh, electric field, uh, uh, anyway, I mean, then, then the force acting on it is an integral over this uh, uh, vector product of these two vectors. Uh, in electrostatics, we had the charges. We know that there are charges, plus and minus charges, but we know them. We can observe them, we can measure the value of the charge, for example, in the Millikan experiment. But uh, we, we, we had a seminar devoted to the Millikan experiments, uh, I believe, three years ago. But we discussed how the Millikan measured the value of the electric charge. And there are no magnetic charges. Yet. The, the magnetic charges called monopoles, they do not exist or in a weaker sense they have not been found and anyway they are not there and therefore the, the Gauss law for the magnetic flux B is pretty simple and because the divergence of the B is equal to zero then we can always represent the magnetic field by, as a rotation of some other vector which is called a vector potential, but of course because there is this differential relation and that will be this D operator acting on something, then there is a problem because the magnetic flux is uniquely defined while the vector potential is not uniquely defined and this is what is called the gauge invariance and that we will, that, that you already all know. But that is, so, on the other hand, we have a magnetostatics, and if I have the electric current which goes over the wire, when this is the geometry of the phenomenon, there is a tangent vector which I denoted by dl, and there is a radius, and look at the certain distance from the wire, then there is a magnetic field, dh, which is given by that formula, and that is what is called the piot savart law. And that is a magnetic field. And uh, the units of a magnetic field are amperes per meter in our legal unit system. So let's, uh, then of course I can calculate the full magnetic field. This is the expression for it. And it obeys the equation that the rotation of the magnetic field is equal to the electric current. So with the magnetic field... Some, something is wrong with this formula because there are two vectors under the integral and one vector on the... There is a vector product missing which yes. was on the previous slide yes, but when you were outset. But it's not present. Yes, well, uh, the certain number of misprints per slides are permitted. So is the number of two pi's. Uh, there was a famous physicist, so the physicist Eliot Montreux, who taught me how he solved the problem of those coefficients. That he always did the write all the equations missing these coefficients, four pi and two pi's and so forth. But then he said that he took a certain number of very well known papers which have been correct and calculated the statistics of the 1 over 4 pi's and 1 over 2 pi's in those papers, get himself a, a histogram and then was applying this uh, histogram to putting the coefficients 1 over 4 pi in his papers uh, by the statistics and he said on average he, I'm fine. So uh, the same is with my rotation, there is one rotation missing but the lower equation is already correct. Okay. Uh, and this, the relation between this formula is because, as I said before, the 1 over x is a, is a, is, is a green function for the Laplace equation in, 
uh, for a Poisson equation, of course, in the three dimension. If I were doing it in the two dimensions, I would have a logarithm there, and if I would be doing it in the one dimension, it would be the modulus. But uh, uh, in most of the applications, we will be using a three dimension real electromagnetism, so the, 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 the problem with the with the logarithmic green functions will not show up. Although, if the logarithmic problem in the green, with the, the, the fact that the, that the green function for two dimension Poisson equation is a logarithm is important in solving the, the problem, which I believe you have been solving also in, uh, at the university, it is a problem if I have a, uh, if I have a, a, a two parallel planes which are uniformly charged and I am looking for electromagnetic, uh, for electric field on a, in a plane which is perpendicular to those two planes, then it is uh, the logarithmic potential. The logarithmic potential is important in many applications, but uh, we will not be discussing it anymore. Okay. Similarly, as I can I, as we related the the displacement field to the to the electric field, we can relate the magnetic flux to the magnetic field H, and this is the formula. The coefficients are called the magnetic susceptibility, and that, of course, magnetic susceptibility, <coughs> this coefficient chi m, is changing its value because it's very small for material, some materials and enormous. I mean, for some materials, it's essentially zero, and, but for some other materials it may be a 10 to the 15. So the magnetic susceptibility variability is much larger uh, in value than uh, the electric constant. So now we shall discuss magnetic moments. And uh, similarly, as I introduce a polarization, I can write the equation for the magnetic field in the following form. And I can define a free current and induced current. And the free current is that with the free, when the free charges are moving, and induced current is a divergence of the magnetization. And uh, 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 this allows me to define a uh, 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 little m as a, a vector product integral of the vector product of the vector x times the current j and uh, for example if I have a circular conductor which carries the current i and which has a radius r then this calculation allows me to calculate the magnetic moment and the value of that magnetic moment is proportional to the surface of this of the, of the circle. So if I had a little loop in which the current goes around, then it has a magnetic moment which is uh, proportional to that current into that area. So since, for example, uh, that is, that was an, just an example. And uh, if I calculate the magnetic moment of induced current, then this expression allows me to do some little bit of calculation. And after all, you, I promise you to do some calculations. So this is how you proceed. There is this triple vector product. And there is this fantastic formula, which is called ABC, ABC is equal but minus tap P A C minus C A B. The triple vector product can be written as a two scalar product multiplied by two vectors. And that is of course something which you either remember in a notation of vectors or you do it in indices. And I believe Katarzyna can do this also with differential forms with, with, without any uh, problems. So uh, this is how you get this expression 
in, uh, in uh, that's my point of the race there. It does not. Anyway, so we can, we can do some calculations. Here we have the triple vector product. So it has these two levy chilita symbols, and this is x and there is this difference. The ill product of two epsilon is given by this Kabbalistic expression. And now I can rewrite the integral with the following form. And then I can partially differentiate, and then I obtain in selecting expression at the bottom. Right? Now, these two coefficients can be easily calculated. This is 3ni and this is just ni, so the difference is, is 2ni two, two and 1 half is in the front side cancel. And since the magnetic field, magnetization of a finite volume has to be finite, the second integral vanishes, and finally I obtain an expression that the magnetic, the, the, magnet, the total magnetization mi is the integral of the magnetization m capital over the volume. So now I had to finally introduce another quantity, which are called the multipoles, and the multipoles are easy to calculate by the expansion. If I take this green function and I try to expand it, assuming x are small, then I get the following expression plus many, many, many other terms. And so therefore, if I plug it, for example, into the expression for the potential, then I can do the easy calculation. And then you see this coefficient in the expansion of the, this denominator. Must be a pointer somewhere. I'm sure I always use my stick. Anyway, so this coefficient corresponds to the Gauss law, and these other coefficients correspond to something like this. And this little vector p, which is equal to that integral, is called the dipole moment. And of course, there are higher order multiples, which I will omit. And you can easily see from there that they are becoming more and more important the closer you are to the origin. If you are far away, they disappear. So very, very far away, they will be on the charge. And you are coming closer to the charge distribution, you see more of the structure. And uh, uh, if you are very, very close, you have to look at the finite details, which is described by the multiple. All right. So if I have an electric field, if I just consider the monopole and the dipole, then the electric field is having the following form. And as you see, this dipolar contribution to the electric field has a 1 over r cube dependence. And that is very... r squared is missing in the numerator. There is r squared. In the second part, second part, first of the second. It's r to the cube. In the denominator, but in the numerator. There are two terms. Yes, and there is r squared. Sorry, yes. Well, nobody's perfect. And uh, this similarly, the same, the same. I, I can calculate it and this I found that there was an error. This is this cut and paste. I mean, the, <laughs> you, you don't want to, to type too many equations in tech, and occasionally you do this wrong, so there is no gradient, of course, here. And the magnetic field caused by the magnetic moment is given by this formula. So, so now I can use this, and there was the reason for it. I can use it to calculate the Lorentz force acting on the magnetic moment. 
and this is a very simple application of it and we got this formula that the force acting on the magnetic moment is, uh, is a gradient of m times b. There are two conclusions from that formula. This is actually the force which you used in the Stern-Gerlach experiment to calculate the properties. But the one of the thing is that the force acting on the magnetic moment is potential. So we, 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 we shoot one, we shoot two rabbits with one bullet. We calculated the force acting on the magnetic moment and we also ob observed that because it's potential, then we know what is the energy of the magnetic moment in the electro in the magnetic field, and this is simply m times b. Therefore, we we know that the energy of a magnetic moment in the field is just a scalar, and this is of course what we what we use in the hundreds and hundreds of the calculations of the of the in the in the in the applications S with the with this in mind, I can calculate the vector potential, and the vector potential can be calculated, and this is the value of the vector potential generated by the by the by the magnetic moment. Okay, so the magnetic okay, and finally we have a Maxwell equations, and with this my time is over. And the Maxwell equations are obviously written in a form which Professor Girol likes. They are in a proper form. But of course, they are, if you look at them, then there are four equations and there are so many of those functions, vector fields. So what is the core of solving it are the constitutive equations. And we already saw those two constitutive equations there was a constitutive relation relating D and E and constitutive relation relating B and H. They are slightly badly written because the D and H comes together and E and P, so there should be H written as a mu times. No, D and B come together because they have the same geometrical meaning in terms of forms. And the, yeah, well, but. This, this is in black because the E is a real physical field. And of course these equations in terms of forms have no sense at all. Because on the left hand side we have a different form and on the right hand side we have a different form which can never be equal. Well, whatever. This, this is, this is what, what it is. But of course the problem is that there is an electric current in this formula. And there is an additional constitutive relation which is called the Umbro, which relates that in the conducting medium, the electric current might be proportional to the electric field. And the coefficient which sits in it is called the conductivity and is measured in units called Siemens. And this is extremely tricky formula because it is, uh, first of all, uh, different truly speaking, if the medium is moving, the omelo in the moving medium must look differently. The same is true for constitutive equations. <coughs> yes, everything is different. And the, uh, but it is so dramatic in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, with the, with the, with the omelo, right? And the other, the, the, there are difficulties with the omelo in the relativistic. This is a problem in a relativistic formulation, how you write that really truly. And um, uh, this is the, 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 and these are the constitutive relations. And now, of course, comes the, another problem, which is called the boundary conditions for all those fields. But I think my time is over, so we stop at that.